For you, is there a game that always pops up in conversation by name or, I don't know, you Google something up because you want to experience a different type of story or gameplay or something just entirely new to you but relevant to the genre of games that you like to play? And a particular game keeps popping up but for one reason or another you completely ignore it? Yeah, for me that was Spec Ops The Line. For the longest, I don't even remember when the first time it is that I actually saw box art of this game. But it definitely grabbed my interest. I was curious. I wanted it. I was determined to pick up this game that I knew absolutely nothing about besides just a menacing soldier on the front cover. I knew I was gonna have this fucking game. And then I completely forgot about it. And it wasn't until about 11 years later, maybe a month or two ago, that I actually finally picked it up. And the reason why it popped back up in my memory was because, for whatever reason, videos were popping up in my feed about it, and I decided to head over to the Steam page, and I read that war crimes are committed in this game. Along with all the players suffering from PTSD, the game giving them emotional trauma, feeling like a horrible person, and every single one of these reviews were thumbs ups. So you knew I was on board. How could I not be? Every person I've ever met in my life that had some type of emotional trauma were amazing people. I mean, of course, they had no regard for their own personal safety, other people's personal safety, or self-respect, respect for other people or other people's things. They are also incredibly insecure, but, but anyways, if you can have that type of experience without the debilitating memory of that type of experience, on top of being able to shoot people, how can you have a negative experience? It's all the fun without the guilt or genuine pain. I was able to experience it for only five bucks, so what's really to lose here? And let me just say, I should have paid more, just out of respect for the developers and the story that you're going to get out of this game. They do not properly make experiences like this. To quote one of the Steam reviews, which I think is incredibly accurate, on the surface it looks like you're getting another generic copy and paste military shooter, but when it's all said and done, it's a completely unique type of story. And it's told in a very different way, it kind of gave me a little bit of a mind fuck. I had to play the game twice on top of watch other, not even watch other videos, just look up what the f*** was going on with the story and then I was able to fully grasp it and appreciate it more because it actually made me feel stupid. I should have been able to put two and two together through the cutscenes but and a second playthrough but apparently I wasn't. Yeah so to be completely honest I had an epic game journalist moment where I just could not fathom what I was experiencing. But to bring you up to speed actually let's start on this game's weakest element. It has to be the gameplay and it's crazy because normally I put that above everything else. Obviously if the game doesn't feel fun what are we doing here? I've never been a fan of games that are incredible well detailed and have beautiful unbelievable photorealistic type of graphics you know the types of games that we basically describe as interactive movies where there's not much gameplay there it's all really for the story Detroit Become Human and The Order are two games that really come to mind like that Spec Ops The Line is nothing like that the gameplay I would say is dated I wouldn't call it clunky or bad or, or a chore to play it just feels a little old which makes it feel more repetitive quicker you know you get sick of it or at least I got sick of it quicker than I felt felt like I should have. It's very heavily cover based. Some people like that type of gameplay. Others don't. I personally don't mind it. Ammunition is pretty scarce because the whole premise of the game is basically you're a three man team from the elite Delta squad sent to Dubai to see if there's any survivors which we'll talk more about the story in a second. But because of this premise ammunition is pretty scarce. There are ammunition crates and ways to replenish your ammunition but more often than not if you're just burning through ammo you're gonna constantly have pick up enemy weapons which range from shotguns, light machine guns, sniper rifles, rifles like the M4, AK K47 or SCAR, you know, stuff that's not entirely out of the ordinary. There are environmental hazards, typical stuff such as explosive barrels. In some instances, you can actually shoot out windows, which will then have moments where enemies are just completely buried in sand because this version of Dubai that you're actually fighting in is completely ravaged by a sandstorm. Historically, one of the worst ones to date, and that's pretty much the main reason why you're here. You're here to see if there's any survivors from a rogue US battalion, the 33 Division, and try to make contact with them, their commander, or any of the civilians that were living in Dubai before the 33rd Division went rogue. So because of this, the main enemies that you're actually fighting are actually US soldiers. Which is crazier because there's moments throughout the game where you can execute said soldiers. I don't know what happened, but my earlier experiences, the executions were a little bit more front and center. And then I ended up having to change my resolution, which went from 4K down to 1080p for whatever reason. So the executions weren't as front and center. Some of them were a little bit more hidden. Or I guess you can say it a little bit out of the camera's view, almost as if the game made a slight adjustment realizing of how quote unquote fucked up it is if it is to be executing American soldiers. But either way, I thought the executions were pretty cool, entertaining. They definitely add to the entire premise of the story. There's also a mechanic where because you have two fellow Delta Squad members with you, you can actually command them to prioritize a specific target in the battlefield. So while it's not a huge or major 
component to it, it does add some tactical, quote unquote tactical gameplay, as you can basically command them to focus on an enemy or get their attention so that way you can flank around them. The gameplay isn't bad. Like I was saying, it just feels mechanically as if it was a game from 2012, which it is. The weapons all feel great to use and sound powerful. The graphics, really, the facial animations and character models all aged well. I really think the story shines in the voice acting and choice of music though. Even the main menu has an eerie version of the Star Spangled Banner playing in the background. On that note, let's discuss the real reason as to why you need to pick this game up, and that is the story. Forgive me if I fuck this up, because again, how can you properly explain something and the roller coaster events of how you come to learn all of this going on? But I wish more games were narratively like this. It was the reason why I wanted to give this game multiple playthroughs to understand my choices, what was going through Walker's head, the character you play as, and experience this game's four possible endings. The game starts up with Walker, Lugo, and Adams involved in a helicopter chase. You don't know it yet, but you're being pursued by remnants of the 33rd Battalion. This is a US battalion that was fighting in Afghanistan and on its way back to the States decided to disobey orders and instead help with the relief efforts in Dubai, which was slowly starting to be consumed by one of the worst sandstorms in the recent decades or some shit like that. So this horrible series of sandstorms slowly started to get worse with it beginning to engulf the city which prompted the 33rd to declare martial law and in turn start committing atrocities on the civilians they were initially trying to help. This is something that's slowly revealed to you as Walker and his squad mates weren't even sure if there was anyone still alive, whether that be American soldiers or civilians. Eventually, Walker, Lugo, and Adams run into some CIA operatives that are in the middle of a protracted war with the rogue 33rd Battalion. Rightfully so, it's a little confusing. You'll start to learn the CIA operatives were sent there to try to cover up the atrocities committed by the 33rd Battalion to avoid local nations in the area declaring war on the United States for what the 33rd did. The operatives armed some civilians that have been relocated, quote-unquote, by the 33rd and with their help, the CIA operatives have been fighting these rogue American soldiers. Which explains why in the very early hours of the game, you're attacked by some insurgents who, in retrospect, believed you were a part of the 33rd. Walker, Lugo, and Adams decide to help the CIA fight back after seeing the 33rd's handiwork performed on the local population. And this triggers a series of events where instead of sticking to their original mission of fighting survivors and reaching out for extraction, Walker instead decides to confront Conrad on his soldiers' actions against not only their own, but against the local population population as well. Personally, I would say minus the confusing war between the CIA and the rogue US troops, the story is arguably pretty straightforward. At least Walker's objective to find Conrad and hold him accountable for his actions is. As the game progresses, the hope of coming into contact with Conrad is slowly growing and constantly being fed, with Conrad even starting to make direct contact with Walker over the radio. And it's by here Conrad starts to taunt Walker or even engage Walker's moral compass. Got snipers. Tell your men not to worry, Captain. The snipers aren't for you. What the fuck is this? This is Dubai, Captain. This is what I face every day. My duty is to maintain order. Without it, we would have died long ago. This is a test. Yes, it is. The civilian on the right stole water. The capital defense. The soldier on the left was sent to apprehend him, which he did, killing the man's family in the process. Five innocent people are dead because these two animals couldn't control themselves. I get it. We're meant to choose. Choose what? Let's get out of here. Lugo's right. We need to get as far away from this as possible. That's enough. Obviously not, because we're still here. They are guilty. What is justice? And how would you see it dealt? This is an order, Captain. Who lives? Who dies? Judge these men. Or pay the price of insubordination. We can't do this, Walker. Yeah, let's just get out of here. And go where? They have us surrounded. Reloading. Dubai appreciates your service, Captain. 
It is these interactions precisely that is misunderstood or even understood in a completely different way once the game finally comes to a close. You see, from the player's perspective, as we go deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole of the 33rd and all their atrocities, there are decisions the player has to make that don't sit well with Lugo or Adams, resulting in dissension between the trio. Contextually, it makes sense, as we as people have our own values, priorities, and opinions. So, what one person values, the other may not. At a few points, Lugo or Adams favor one course of action while the other advocates the opposite. Regardless of what, the player has to make a choice and we gotta just accept it to push the mission of making contact with Conrad forward. No matter what we do, it's all blamed as Conrad doing it. He's the one pulling the strings because of his men, because of his level of power and respect he has over his men. They're more than willing to accept what must be done no matter the cost, even if that comes at the cost of innocent civilians' lives or executing former brothers in arms. And these decisions that Walker makes make sense to the player as well as Walker because ultimately that is the objective. That is the mission that he's going to try to achieve, to hold Conrad accountable for all of this. But it doesn't make sense with Lugo or Adams at certain points in the story, with them not only at odds with each other, but at odds with Walker, his decisions, what he's saying, what's going through his head. And there's a couple points where it, you just can't really understand why his men are bickering with him or so inquisitive of his actions. But it comes off as you being able to dismiss it because who knows, maybe you're just stressed out because you're going against American soldiers. You're going against your own. But it's not until they very end where you understand the full picture. On the final mission, the last pieces of the 33rd finally surrender to Walker, with a soldier mentioning Conrad is where he's always been, at the top of the tallest tower in Dubai waiting for Walker. When Walker reaches the penthouse, there's a conversation between the two where, fuck it, I'ma actually play it. Now that you're here, I wanna ask you a question. What did you think when you arrived in Dubai? When you'd seen what I had done, did you think it the work of a madman? Yeah. I thought you'd lost your goddamn mind. Or I hope that's what happened. Oh yes. That would have made things easier. But I wasn't that lucky. You sure about that? I assure you. I'm as sane as you are, Captain. I'm as sane as you are, Captain. Eerie words considering Conrad is actually dead. This conversation as well as every single interaction between the two of them throughout the course of the entire game were all figments of Walker's imagination. Even the soldiers surrendering in the lobby of this hotel were all hallucinated. This entire game we've been witnessing a man slowly descend into madness trying to find ways to cope with everything he's been doing. From killing innocent civilians by using a poisonous attack to hallucinating Lugo's betrayal. Since Lugo ended up dying on his watch, he couldn't come to terms that he failed him, so it was easier to imagine him being a traitor and that's why he died. Not Walker's incompetence or inability as a leader to protect his men, or at least that's how I interpreted that. I could be wrong. He finally had to come to terms with everything. It was all him. And what's it gonna be? What's his choice? This is where, obviously, the four possible endings happen. You can either let Conrad kill you, which basically means Walker commits suicide. And the game immediately ends here, showing a cutscene of Walker's corpse next to Conrad and the old message of Conrad asking for help playing in the background. Or if Walker shoots Conrad, you get to experience the epilogue where you find a patrol of American soldiers locating a shell-shocked and delusional Walker wearing Conrad's uniform. From here, you have two choices. You can surrender, relinquish your weapons, and return home where Walker asks a soldier what his status is. If you choose to fight the patrol, there are two outcomes of that as well. If you die, an old conversation from his time fighting in Afghanistan with Conrad starts to play. Walker casually mentions returning home in this conversation, and Conrad then criticizes him, claiming they don't get to go home. Soldiers do what's necessary and then die. And that's how Walker dies, bleeding to death. If you beat the patrol, Walker picks up a radio and greets Army Command with his opening line of the game. The same line Conrad said to him in the beginning in his radio transmission. Falcon 1, this is Command. Do you copy? We heard shots. Is everything okay? Sergeant Roberts, what is going on? Gentlemen, welcome to Dubai. I can't really say which of these four endings I like, because in retrospect, they all have different, I guess you can say, emotional impacts. There is no happy ending. No matter what, if Walker chooses to live, he has to come to terms with everything he's done. If he dies, either by the American patrol or directly by suicide, it's still a damaged, broken man with no sense of salvation or redemption for everything he's done. Meanwhile, with the other two outcomes, he's delusional. Who knows if he's ever going to be capable of being brought back to the brink of sanity. A phenomenally written story. 
and one that I highly recommend. This game, again, is actually on sale for $5 on Steam. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. The game plays whatever, but the story, man, I wish, I mean, I don't know how Jaeger would have, would have ever been able to create some type of sequel. I don't think that would have ever happened, but to have stories like this told, you know, the fact that they were able to even pull something off like this in a video game, normally stuff like this is done in movies, but to do it in a video game, it just shows how flexible narratives can be in gaming now. And the game itself is only six hours. So in six hours flat, you can beat the entire game, go back, re-experience it, reinterpret every single thing however you want to. I'm sure there's plenty of messages to be pulled out of this story, and I'm curious as to what message you would have pulled out of this. Let's talk down below in the comments section. Did you ever play Spec Ops The Line? Have you heard anything about it? Have you been curious about it? I've been kind of on a kick lately of just playing older games, older experiences, stuff I've already played or, or in this case, have never played and was completely blown out of the water. But like always, guys, my name is Cynic. Thank you all so much for watching, but until next time, I'll see y'all later. Oh, join the disc.